Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our conversation with Dr. John Harrington. Uh, my name is Matthew Brogdon. I am the executive director for Hesperus, and I'm happy to say that uh, John is a member and a lead on our advisory board at Hesperus. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, down the road, but uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody to our event here to celebrate both Native American Heritage Month as well as Veterans Day in the month of November. I know it's busy for a lot of us for those two reasons, but I'm excited to see a lot of folks uh, that have tuned in to hear our discussion today. Um, you know, the, the goal and the, the mission of Hesperus is to create education, employment, and technology opportunities for Native Americans and Alaska Natives, including veterans. We wanna make sure folks have broadband connectivity throughout the United States, no matter where they are in their tribal communities. And we also want to ensure that they have the skills and the um, opportunities to get employment with the digital opportunities and digital inclusion in the 21st century. So, um, you know, I'm happy to say that John has volunteered to be on our advisory board and uh, has shared a lot with us already. And I thank him for that. The big thing is that um, he shared so much with so many other people. So I want to get to our discussion with him. Tim and, and talk. This is going to be very wide ranging and free. Uh, John's already warned me a couple of times that he likes, lo he loves lots of questions. So I would ask people to add their questions in the chat as they come up. We can ask them as we move forward and we can also save them toward the end. The last thing I'm going to say is how I met um, John. I was at an ACES conference a few years ago, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. And I was in the veterans talking circles. The first time I've ever been to ACES is the first time I've been to a talking circle. I sat next to John and we had a great discussion with the group as well as trading some stories and some items uh, while we were in there. And then we walked out. I, I, you know, I think we left as friends even then, John. Um, mm -hmm. Probably 10 minutes later, I ran into Chris Key, uh, who I attended with the conference. And I said, yeah, I was over there. I, I had a great time. I was talking with John over there and I pointed to him and he goes, do you know who that is? And I said, yeah, it's John Harrington. He's a nice guy. He goes, yeah, you need to read up on who you're talking to at these events. And so I ultimately did. And, you know, I, I never would have known his background or anything, but it was great to meet him that way. So welcome, John. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Matt. My pleasure. Nice to be here. So it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to kind of just do some Q&A and share some stories. And I enjoyed uh, certainly meeting you, meeting you at ACES and having a chance. You need to talk about your background. You need to tell us where you're from, because I think a lot of folks don't realize that, because we're going to we're gonna share uh, each other's stories here as we go through this. Sure. I appreciate that. Um, third generation uh, military veteran. My grandfather's, you know, one was uh, in Patton's Third Army as an infantryman in World War II. My other grandfather was a P-51 pilot in um, World War II and U.S. Army Air Corps and then Air Force. My dad was an Air Force Vietnam vet. 23 year career. And then, uh, uh, you know, without subtle prodding, a lot of bit of overt prodding, um, he pushed me into thinking about and considering the Air Force Academy. I'm an Air Force Academy graduate and a former United States Army officer before I went into recruiting in tech. That's what yeah. people think. You go to Air Force Academy, but you're in the Army. A lot of people went, right. to the Air, went, people went to the uh, West Point and went to the Air Force. Tom Stafford is one of those. So, hey, bear with me a second. A timer just went up. My lasagna is in the oven. And <laughs> I'm going to turn it. I'm going to move it and stand by. This, this is a terrible timing on my part. I'm glad you're comfortable. That's good. So uh, we're going to talk again today with a lot of folks or with uh, John about a lot of folks and a lot of things he's gone done in, in his life. I would love to see questions in the chat and we'll make sure we get to as many of those as possible. Um, uh, as you all can see, John's gonna be pretty informal and we're gonna be um, really discussing and working through a lot of things here. So how's the lasagna, is it, is it still good? Oh, I think you're on, you're on mute, John. It's gonna brown for about 10 minutes. I gotta jump back up a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I, being, a, being a single guy here with my dog, I, you know, I have to do all the cooking, so. You gotta do what you gotta do. So. Yeah, no one wakes up one day when they're three and they're, when they're three years old and says, I'm going to be an astronaut. Or if they do, they have no idea what that's going to take. So, you know, I want to hear about when you grew up as a child. Yeah. What, what were you into? What was it all about? Well, you know, there are there were folks in the office, you know, when I was in the astronaut office. So when they were seven years old, 
they said, I'm going to be an astronaut. And they did everything in their power to become astronauts. And I'll tell you, I admire that to no end, but that's just not the reality for everybody in the office. You know, a lot of us, you know, took a circuitous path uh, to get to the point where, hey, I'm, I'm qualified and, you know, I'm competitive to be an astronaut. Now, let's, let's go ahead and follow a dream we had as a kid, which I certainly did. When I was, I tell a story a lot. I was eight years old, my brother and a guy named Lynn Miller, we lived in Black Forest, Colorado, out, you know, just kind of north, northeast of Colorado Springs. And, uh, and Lynn had this big refrigerator box and my brother and Lynn were good friends. And so they invited me over, which is kind of interesting. My brother invited his little brother to come play, which doesn't always happen. Uh, but they had this uh, refrigerator box and, and what was going on at the time were the Apollo missions. And Jim and I, had, I think Jim and I was just completing and, and we we're getting ready to go to the moon. Maybe Apollo 8 um, was, you know, kind of circle the moon. And so, you know, we'd sit in this cardboard box and dream we were going to the moon, you know, and we, we played astronaut. That was something I, I played. I, I can't say that I honestly thought I would pursue it. Uh, but, you know, as a kid, you watch this stuff on TV. I'd also go back to my house and we had a hummingbird feeder in the backyard and I would lay on a chase lounge and I pulled this red blanket up over me and I, my eyes poked out to watch the hummingbirds fly. You know, I was just, I was intrigued by flight. My dad was a pilot. Um, I think he gave me my first flying lesson when I was about 10. Um, my dad had a little Aronica champ and my, and then he sold it and bought a, bought a little uh, Cessna 150 and he became an instructor pilot and he would teach others to fly and people would pay him for that. You know, he would just take me up and my brother up and then uh, I'd fly the plane while he took pictures and it never really got real instruction from my dad. And I never learned my, my pilot's license until, um, until, you know, I was in the Navy. But this idea growing up, you know, I, I was born in Oklahoma. Um, I'm a citizen of Chickasaw Nation on my mom's side of the family. My great grandmother, Bina Underwood, is my, uh, it was on the original Dawes Rolls. And so the way the Chickasaw Nation does citizenship is that you have to show descendancy on the Dawes Rolls. And so my great grandma, by an Underwood uh, and her parents, and then her grandparents were on there. Her grandparents were Ima, uh, were Shimon Tichi, where it was her grandma, and Ishtahotepe was her uh, grandpa. And so I, um, I actually have that, you know, that that document uh, that shows that. And that's where you know the history beyond that on my the native side of the family is like, well, I would love to know more about that, but it was oral history, and at least I have the names, you know, the the uh, um, Chikasha names of my. My great, great, great grandparents. Um, once again, that's how the tribe does citizenship. So, uh, but I didn't grow up in Oklahoma. I moved um, to Colorado for uh, probably most of my, probably the sixth, I think sixth grade, moved to Wyoming for about three years, and then moved to Texas for about four. And then uh, when I was a senior in high school, my parents, I wasn't living with my parents, unfortunately. And when I was a senior, I lived with a friend because I got tired of moving. I, I moved about 14 times by the time I got out of high school. And the last year I said, you know, can I stay in one place? I'm just sick and tired of moving. And so I ended up living with a, a guy named uh, Gary Gentry and his parents in uh, Plano, Texas. My parents uh, up and moved back to Colorado with my, my sister who was 15 years younger than me. And uh, after I graduated in February, I think 76, I ended up going back to Colorado. And that's where, uh, that's where I had grown up. So to me, that was, I was going home essentially. Um, and I entered the University of Colorado that fall with the idea of being a forest ranger. Um, you know, I, I like the mountains. I wanted to work in the mountains. I didn't want to work behind a desk. And, and so I find myself kind of wandering out of, off of campus. You know, I didn't live on campus. You know, U University of Colorado, Colorado Springs was a, was a commuter, uh, community university, essentially. Yeah, and yeah. so I would go out to, you know, garden the gods and hang out because it was comfortable. I liked it. I used to scramble on the rocks and but then I met two guys rock climbing one day that actually said, hey, do you want to, I guess I was, a, I, I, was a I was at the bottom of the climb and they looked down at me and took pity on me, I think, and said, hey, you want to learn? And I said, yeah. So I started climbing with a guy named Scott Woods, who I'm you know, still very good friends with, and a guy named Steve Knudsen, and, and they taught me to climb. And I just, I loved it. I loved the thrill of it. I loved the challenge, the physical challenge, this uh, something I hadn't done before. Now I was scaling rocks in a manner that I hadn't, hadn't done before you can scramble rocks is one thing but start climbing with ropes and, and protection right. is a whole different thing so that was where I, I kind of focused my energy <laughs> and I didn't focus my my education in that direction and <laughs> and uh you know when you don't study you don't you know you don't pass I, I played flag football that year too and and just uh you know I wasn't interested in school and so you know and I wasn't I wasn't intelligent I just didn't have a motivation to be there yeah. And that lack of motivation led to a 1.72 grade point and a suspension letter. 
my second semester. And, and since I was working, um, I was, I was working part-time going to school part-time and I didn't realize it's something I didn't realize at the time when you're going to school part-time and you get less than a 2.0 GPA, you're gone. You know, they don't give us, they don't give you a probation letter. They just say, John, right, right. Harder. they just kick you out. And so I, I got this letter one day that I was kicked out of school. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I was okay. I, I thought, well, what I'm going to do, I, I'm going to, I got to do something else. I, I was paying for my own education, um, you know, work study, pay grants. I think I took out one loan, which was maybe a thousand dollars, which is un, you know, inconceivable today. Right. But, um, you know, and, and I ended up working for, I was working for a restaurant in Colorado Springs who sent me to Texas to work in another restaurant. Um, and I had this idea, well, I'll be a chef. You know, I liked working in restaurants. I've been doing it all through high school. And um, I worked at Steak and Ale. I worked at the Sunbird. I worked at Bonanza, uh, Willow Bend Polo and Hunt Club. Um, you know, I was pretty good at flipping steaks. And so um, they sent me to Texas to become a chef. Uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I worked in a place called the Luminarius Restaurant up off the uh, Turnpike, overlooking uh, downtown Fort Worth. And I, I tell you, I was miserable. Not because I was in Fort Worth. But I would go to work at two in the afternoon and I was running the kitchen during the day uh, and I was like 18 years old. And, uh, you know, I thought I had a little bit of responsibility and I did. Uh, but that led to some, you know, consternation. Some of the guys that worked for me didn't like the fact this young kid was telling them what to do. Right. So right. I, I got in some scraps um, with some people and, and I'd work, you know, till 11, 12 o'clock at night, play poker till four in the morning, you know, drinking, just, you know, just terrible life. And um and uh, I hated it. And I was fortunate that I had this guy I used to work with. I called him one day just to, just to talk to him. And he said, hey, I'm, I've been looking for you. you know, I've got a job for you. And I said, doing what? And he said, rock climbing. What? What? I get, I get paid to rock climb? Right. <laughs> so he said, yeah, it's on a survey crew in the mountains. We need people that know how to use ropes. And, and so I uh, ended up, uh, I told my, called my dad. I said, hey, I got this great opportunity to, you know, to, you know, job rock climbing in the mountains. He goes, that's nice. Don't quit. You got a good job. Don't quit. You know, and I'm like, okay, well, that was on a Thursday. I quit on Friday. Uh, hopped in my car, drove to uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, next following Monday. And I started working on Interstate, Interstate 70 as a rock climber and as part of a survey crew. So, John, I don't want to interrupt you, but at no point from the time you left school with your 1.72 until you found that job uh, as a as a professional climber, I would say, you know, supporting it as a job. What I didn't hear from you is that the sky is falling. I don't know what to do. I don't, don't have any resources. This is my path. What you did is, uh, you know, what I love about your story is that you adapted and you were like, hey, this is the situation. Now I just got to roll with it to the best well, of my ability. I didn't have any money. You know, I was, I remember I was living in a rundown shack in a really bad part of Fort Worth. And I didn't have money for either gas or electricity. I forget which. I couldn't have one of those two in my house because uh, I didn't have the money for it. And so my brother came by one day. He was living in Dallas. He drove by and saw me. And, and he said, I got to get you out of here. And so my brother picked me up and moved me to live with him in southern, South Dallas. And I would commute every day to Fort Worth um, in my Carmen Gia. Wow. Um, you know, I didn't have any money. And I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was dirt poor. And uh, ended up... Um, you know, kind of jumped from house to house. I lived with the manager of the restaurant, assistant manager for a bit, um, you know, because it was cheap. And um, I would eat, you know, I'd, I'd eat steak that would come back, you know, from the restaurant. You know, I'd eat the steak that came back from a table because it was free. You know, right. It's disgusting right. now. I would know, I can't imagine I did that. But when you're, you know, when you're 18 years old, you don't have any money. You know, you work in a restaurant. That's one of the bennies of it is you can eat there either cook your own food or eat somebody, eat somebody else's. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. It, it was a challenge. I mean, it was, and, and I was depressed and, you know, and that's why I called a friend and luckily that friend, uh, hey, guess what? My bell went off right back. It's lasagna it's time. Yeah. All right, Evie, how is it? How's the lasagna? It smells, it smells wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Anyway, anyway, that's, that's kind of the journey, how I got to the, to the first job that, you know, fundamentally changed my life. And, um, I got, I got paid $4 an hour, lived in the mountains, um, room and board was paid, you know, and, and I got to ski on weekends because everybody else would go home to their place in Greeley or Fort Collins. And, right. and I lived in the mountains. So I would go skiing at Aspen or go to Vail and, and, uh, you know, Hey, you know, what a great thing for an 18, 19 year old kid. Right. Um, but the guy I worked for, um, you know, sat me down one day 
and ask what I was gonna do when I grew up, you know, and, and I thought I was growing up, you know, I was, I was 18, 19, living on my own. And, you know, I was had money now and, and a little bit of money, not much, but some. And he said, well, why don't you go back to school, you know, come back and be the engineer. Don't, don't be the lowest guy on the rung of the ladder. I mean, this is fun, but you can't raise a family on fun. <laughs> you can't raise a family on $4 an hour. Right. You, know, you get your butt back into school and become the engineer, be the one responsible for, for this. And so the, the experience of working with people that enjoyed what they did, uh, using math and, you know, math is part of their job. And I had never seen it that before. And so you ask questions and I, there's a neat thing. I traveled with this company. I would, I worked in Iowa. On, I helped survey a highway under the, um, in the Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, off of the cornfields of Iowa. And me and another guy and, and, you know, did all the preliminary survey for it. Had a lot of responsibility as a little kid. And, uh, and I, I enjoyed what I did. So I did, I'm going to be a civil engineer. Gosh, darn it. I like this. I'm going to be a civil engineer. So that's when I'm back to school. That's what I studied. And, um, I studied engineering. Now I had a, I had more of a motivation to study. Um, I, I, uh, I also had a, neat, a circle of friends I didn't have before. Right. Uh, before I was going to school by myself, essentially, and and being shy and introverted, I didn't, you know, I didn't reach out to others. But now I had a motivation, and some of the guys I was around, uh, they had that motivation as well, and we we uh, we became good friends, and ended up uh, doing really well. You know, before. You know, one point seven two grade point. Now I brought it up to a three point one or three point two, and that's not bad when you're taking calculus and physics and modern physics and you know advanced calculus and you know all these type of things that I you know that I probably didn't think I, I was capable of early on. But now I had a motivation. When you're motivated, you know it's it's a bit easier to learn something. Where were you in school at this point, John? Uh, University of Colorado, and then I, I went to Boulder for a semester because that's where they they uh, you know, civil engineering degree. But I lived with a bunch of rock climbers um, on a just off campus, and they were some of the top rock climbers in the United States or the world for that matter. But um, they had some interesting lifestyles. I had people knock on the door at two or three in the morning, um, you know, wanting drugs, and I realized that I need I needed to move. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to move, so I, I called in, my aunt and uncle lived in Loveland, and I ended up going and living with my aunt and uncle uh, for the rest of the semester. And so I just can't handle Boulder, you know, and I, I couldn't afford Boulder, just too yeah. expensive to live there. And so I went back to to Colorado Springs. I found a little cabin for hundred bucks a month off the Broadmoor, and uh, uh, then I found another house that I, I roomed with two other guys. You know, I think I paid seventy. I think I paid ninety dollars a month for rent at the time. Oh my gosh! In a little two, a rod more. Wow. Duplex. Rode my bike to school every day because my car. I, I wrecked my car, and uh, so rode my bike to school for three years. Yeah, something like that. And uh, and changed my major a couple of times, but by then I was really good at math. I, I really liked working in my the math problems, and I was working for the math department as a a tutor grader for calculus. Uh, Nancy Baggs was an instructor there and she's a great calculus instructor. And I, I would, you know, I'd, I'd sub for her sometimes. And then I ended up living with the head of the math department, a guy named Jim Modier, who had me move in with him. His wife had just died. And he said, hey, can you move in and be a role model for my son? And I said, what's, what's your son? He goes, well, he's a punk rocker in high school and I don't want to drop out. So you'd be a good role model. So I move into Jim's house and uh, his son was just a, was a hoot, had half his head was shaved and his checkerboarded and smart kid, hated school. You know, he ended up dropping out anyways, but uh, he, Mark went on to doing some remarkable stuff as, a, as an adult. So I guess I wasn't much of a role model, but. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it was a little early, a little early for that. Yeah, well, Jim, uh, Jim Modier uh, was the head of math department and he said, hey, I've got a student for you. And I said, that's kind of cool. You know, what, you know, to teach calculus? He goes, yeah, and he needs a tutor. And I, I assumed, you know, like, you know, a kid my age. And he goes, no, this guy's retired Navy captain. He flew, uh, he flew in World War II and he just retired and he would, he needs a calculus tutor. So think about it, this is the 1970s, this is the early, early 80s. And, and uh, Captain Knockle, Richard Knockle, um, needed a calculus tutor. He was taking computer science classes. And, and so I became his calculus tutor and he became my Navy tutor. And uh, funny thing, I knew his daughter, uh, Barbara, was a, a wonderful young lady. I, I uh, knew her when I first started back to college. And then uh, I got to meet Richard Knockle, and he encouraged me to join the Navy. So as a senior, I, I went down and took the test, the ASVAB, and recruiters that did really well, you know. Um, yeah, so I went up, you know, raised my right hand and, and uh, swore, swore the oath and 
joined the Navy in uh, November of 83. Were you thinking about flying at that time or you just thought about being a Naval officer? <laughs> No, at the time I was flying because, you know, Jim, or because uh, Captain Nauckel had flown Dauntless dive bombers in World War II. He's also a helicopter pilot. He said, John, there's nothing greater, nothing more challenging than flying off a carrier, you know, flying in the Navy. And so I went out with this notion of being a carrier pilot and um, I wanted to fly. You know, I wanted to get shot off the end of an aircraft carrier and, uh, you know, in, end up going through flight schools. First in my class in flight school, I was second in my class in officer candidate school. And the thing was, I didn't, you know, I never imagined joining the Navy. I never imagined joining the military. You know, I grew up in a town where the Army was on one side of town, Air Force was on the other. And I didn't like what I saw on either side. And it wasn't, you know, just I didn't know anybody. I hadn't talked to anybody. I just had this perception of what these folks were. The Air Force guys were really rich. They drove the really nice cars. They dated all the women. The Army guys on the other side of town were getting into fights and, and uh, you know, down in the south end of town. And, but I didn't know them. I didn't, mean, I didn't meet any of them. You know, if I didn't sit that sums enough, up Colorado Springs today, John. That sums awesome. up Colorado Springs today. It's the same way now. Air oh, Force yeah, it is. Side, Army it on is. the south side. It's the same description now. Yeah, Army on the uh, uh, Air Force on the east side, too. You go out to Shriver, you go out to Pete Field, and yeah, they're, the Air Force is kind of, you know, they kind of got that, that town all wrapped up, with the exception of the Army in the south yeah. end. They got them surrounded. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, like I say, it was, uh, it was eye-opening to meet somebody in the military that encouraged me to do something that I, that I hadn't thought about doing. And, and so I went, he said, you got to go see the movie officer and a gentleman. You know, that's, I'm, I'm dating myself. Right. I, I tell a story now to some people, they go, what movie, who Richard Gere, never heard of the guy. What? Yeah. And, and so I ended up taking a date. I took a date to see that movie and my car broke down on the way. And um, this is an even funnier story. I got, I pulled over the side of the road and uh, ended up getting um, bumped in the back of my car by two guys pushed me and my car my date out into this intersection out uh, Woodman Road uh, Academy Boulevard and I jumped out of the car and I you know started getting onto the guy and dude on the passenger side leans over with a gun and points it right at me big shiny big shiny pistol right at my head and said I was blocking traffic and uh, <laughs> I took I took a step back and I walked backwards to my car. I thought, this guy's going to shoot me. And uh, the dude pulled up next to me, rolled down the passenger side. And I thought, I'm a dead man. And the guy says, hey, dude, sorry. He drives off into the darkness. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't tell that story very often. But yeah, and the guy, that, the cop that came, the sheriff that came to uh, take my, uh, my statement was named Harrington. <laughs> wow. So yeah, that was, uh, but I saw the movie. Quite the day. That's quite the date. So did you see, did you see her after that? Or was that a one and one? And I think that was a one, that was a one and done. <laughs> yeah. She thought you were too dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, I, uh, you know, I, I, I ended up uh, joining the Navy and, uh, you know, I said, took all my hair and cut it off. And, and, you know, the thing was I flourished in it and it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. And it was the idea of going from being an individual to being uh, in a group of people who had a common goal. And, and we worked well together and, you know, we all had challenges, you know, the obstacle course had academics, you know, uh, military PT, all, of, all this precision, this really intricate attention to detail stuff that I'd never had experienced in my adult life. And now I was tossed into this and, and getting yelled at by a Marine is something everybody in life needs to experience uh, <laughs> because I have a deep abiding respect for professionals that have that, that mold you into something that you, that you weren't when you came to the gate. Um, and that was, um, I'll always be indebted to, you know, to the, to the folks, the, the Marines I had. Uh, uh, and to this day, and to, to this day, if I see a drill instructor and I hear him, you know, barking something, I, it, I lock it up, man. It's tight uh, up. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah, visceral. Yeah. it's absolutely visceral. But, you know, if you can't take it and yelled at by a guy, you can't take being on an airplane in a dark stormy night with, a, with an engine failure, you know, so there's a, there's a purpose behind it. And uh, did well, came out second in my class. Um, yeah, I get what was called, the, there's a little award they give to all the candidates uh, that some of the candidates get. There's a military award, a, uh, a PT award, physical training, and there's an academic award. Uh, and you each get one of those. Well, one guy in the class gets all three and I got all three, it's called the snowflake. And so I had the snowflake award and, and I was a second, uh, I was a commander, battalion commander and, and uh, went off to flight school. And I came out first in my class in flight school. And at the time I, I got married and, and my wife was a computer programmer and I started looking at, do I want to go to sea and be at sea for six months? And, and the places we could live, you know, in my mind was we could live in the Bay Area 
my wife get a job as a computer programmer, I'd have a Navy job, we'd double income, no kids, we'd do really well. Plus, you know, P3 pods get paid better. <laughs> True. So I end up, I end up flying P3s and I'm glad I did because it was a, you know, I, I, one thing I regretted was not going to the boat. And that was probably my biggest regret in the military was not going to the boat. Cause I, you know, I could have trained to do it. I've, I've flown, I've flown jets when I transitioned to test pilot school and, you know, going to the boat, flying, a, you know, flying's flying. And, uh, but that was one regret that I made a decision, but I lived with it and, and I did really well, my squadron and came out uh, with this notion that, you know, if, if I really want to be an astronaut and that's when it started to rise up again, right. with the, you know, I'm in the military. If I want to go that path, I got to go to test pilot school. I got to get a master's degree. I have to pursue it now because I like what I do. I like flying. And that's the next, to me, the next step was that. And so I applied to test pilot school a couple of times. I uh, got selected on my second application, uh, went to Pax River, you know, put my mathematical skills to practice flying airplanes which you know, I, I didn't realize you could take a, an airplane and make it a second order system and find out the you know, resonant frequencies and things like that and do body plots and do all these things that you, know, you can tell the engineer what's wrong with his airplane. And uh, that was great fun. Hard, hardest, probably the hardest class I've ever had was uh, test pilot school. And, so John, I don't wanna interrupt you, but on this, yeah. I wanna give the audience an idea of how difficult it is to become a test pilot. You know, obviously difficulty uh, ranges for all flying platforms, depending on the airframe, right? But test pilot school is very competitive. I just, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it, it's real competitive. The, uh, I'd applied the first time and, and two guys that I heard from the East Coast were selected and the guy that was the alternate was senior to me in my squadron. So I knew that I didn't stand a snowball's chance uh, getting selected the next selection because this guy was ahead of me. He got all the, he would get all the endorsements there's just, you know, but if you don't apply, you won't be coming out. You won't become a test pilot. Right. And, and I wasn't going to apply because I didn't think I'd get it. Right. So a friend of mine at the wings and, you know, encouraged me, he says, John, are you going to apply? And I said, no, nah, it's that guy's going to get it. And he goes, no, nah, I think I really think you need to apply. I said, no, nah, it's a long application. I'll, I'll go fly for the airlines. And because I, you know, I, if I want to go be an astronaut, I've got to go to test pilot school and I'm not going to get it. So he goes, no, nah, you need to reapply, you know. We call it, you know, a foot, foot knocker, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've heard that, you know, you hear this is like, there's a reason, right? So I applied and I went to the, my friend that was going to get selected and I congratulated him and said, hey, I know you're going to get it this year. He goes, you know, I didn't apply this year. Yeah, I'm not ready for it. Oh, I got selected. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so when you go to a door knocker, you know, or a foot knocker, you listen to him, you know, listen to him. Yeah. yeah, and it's a theme we'll revisit, John, but, you know, Great advice from people close to you, right? We'll talk about that uh, toward yeah. the end, but you know, a constant theme I hear, and it's it's common in my life. I know it's common with a lot of people on this call is when people you trust or people who you don't necessarily know but know you come out and say, "Hey, you really should do this." Yeah, uh, I think that's important that we are surround ourselves with people like that in life. And, and listen, you know, you're the one who makes the ultimate decision, but sometimes there's a reason behind when people tell you that, and uh, and and lo and behold, that that was un unbeknownst to me. Uh, that was the reason why he, he, cause he worked for the Admiral. So, um, friend, my friend of mine worked for the Admiral was one of my squadron mates. So, you know, pay attention when people, you know, toss something at you. Um, so I, I transitioned to jets. I flew a fours, uh, out of, uh, Beeville, Texas, uh, way back in the day. I went to test pilot school and realized that I've gone flying, you know, <laughs> flying a big airplane with multi engines to, uh, little jets by myself. And so it was a huge transition. And really the airplane was always 50 feet in front of me. Cause it flew much faster, you know, things happen a lot faster in jets and, but you know, I, I got used to it. And then I'd, you know, I'd fly test pilot school and do, uh, you know, do flying qualities, performance evals, uh, flew about probably 25 different airplanes while I was there. Um, wow. an F-18 to a Pitts to a T-33 to a Learjet, uh, went to France and flew an Alpha jet in France for my final project. Um, it was tough. I mean, it was hard work and, and, uh, you know, were frustrating times. Um, you know, I, I wasn't the top of my class. I was somewhere in the middle. Um, but to me, it was a, it was a, it was a real challenge to be able to do, you know, go into transition to jets, now fly jets and do, do flight tests in a platform that's probably a lot faster than you're thinking. And I, you know, it took me a while, but I, I, I picked it up and uh, did okay. Uh, then I realized if I, I went to the squadron, uh, the test squadron, uh, and you, you think you're busy as a test pilot, wait, as, as a test pilot at school, uh, it's even, you're even busier as a test pilot. And, and so I flew all sorts of stuff. You know, I, you know, the P3s, I flew for the army. I flew, um, I was given 
you know, really ultimate responsibility for a you know 29 year old uh, naval officer was a multi million dollar budget and an engineer. And we were told to go interface with the Air Force uh, for the new primary trainer. What? <laughs> so yeah, so I got I got picked to be the, the JPATS Joint Primary Aircraft Training System. So myself and a guy named Mike Exegian, an engineer, uh, it was up to us to go out and interface with the Air Force and start flying the similar form. We we flew T thirty seven. They got to fly the T two. We, um, you know, and, and learn what the Air Force wanted. And they didn't learn what the Navy wanted. And I got to fly some of the jets that were going to compete for the final you know, the, the final contract. And you talk about, you know, great experience for, you know, a, a test pilot to go out and do quality valves on, on jets that are just a hoot to fly. <laughs> <laughs> that was great fun. And the thing is, I, I, according to my skipper, I did really well. I was first, I was a number one lieutenant out of, you know, competitive lieutenant out of like 25 or 30 lieutenants. Uh, so I, you know, I, I worked hard in it and I was rewarded for it by my skipper. And, uh, and I appreciate that. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why I was competitive for the astronaut corps, because I did really well in a competitive environment doing flight tests against my peers. And, um, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to think that's what was the, uh, you know, really kind of, it pushed me or pushed it over the edge for me, but I don't know. And I wasn't the one that made the final decision. So you're no three at that point, right? Uh, you're yeah. Lieutenant. And then You've always got this goal of, uh, or now at this point, you got this goal of going to NASA and becoming an astronaut. How does that play out for your the rest of your naval career and then you, and your transition? What does that look like? Well, it, the way it works is in the Navy, you do a, a, a sea tour, you know, three to four year sea tour, and then you transition to, to a shore tour. And then the shore tour, for me, it was test pilot school and flight test. At the end of that, you go back to sea duty. In my case, it would be a disassociated sea tour. I'd go to the boat, and I'd be a shooter, I'd be shooting guys off the end of the aircraft carrier. Or I would stay in flight test and become what's called an aeronautical engineering duty officer. And I knew to be competitive for an astronaut corps, you know, I needed to have a master's degree. And if I went to the boat, I wasn't going to get a master's degree. You know, right. if I did, it would be, it would add that much more to what I was already doing. So um, I, I transitioned in the Navy, which I, I like flight test. I like being an acquisition. And, and to me, that was fun. Uh, it was challenging. And so I applied what to call, what's called aeronautical engineering duty officer. And I got selected. And the Navy sent me out to Monterey to get a master's degree. So I ended up, you know, spent about two and a half years in Monterey, California, uh, Naval Postgraduate School, getting a, uh, uh, a master's in aeronautical engineering. Not a bad gig. Uh, Not a bad, well, yeah, I, I didn't see it. I was, you know, I was in class all the time. I, you know, my big, my big exercise was to run around 17 mile drive, you know, and, and run marathons and run a marathon and run 10 Ks all the time. That was my exercise. But, right. Uh, but I, you know, it made me competitive. And that master's degree, along with being a fixed wing engineering test pilot, I'd applied to NASA once as a pilot astronaut. And since I didn't have a thousand hours of tactical jet time, so I flew a jet engine. My engine had a turboprop, had a prop on the end of it. And right. in, in the Navy's mind and NASA's mind, that's not a jet, but, you know, it's a jet engine. Um, if it didn't have a prop on the end, it would have been fine because, you know, Air Force uh, officers you know, like uh, Eileen Collins and Pam Melroy both flew large multi-engine transports in the Air Force, they were jet engines and they had, they had qualified to, to be a, a pilot. Um, but so next time I applied, I applied as a mission specialist. And now I was, I was even that much more competitive as a fixed wing engineering test pilot as a mission specialist. I got the best, I got the far, the best job in the office. I got to fly the jet in the front seat still in my flight time, get my flight pay and I got to walk in space. So I'm happy. I, I would love to have flown the shuttle and commanded the shuttle. That'd have been a fabulous thing. But I got a chance to hang outside. This this guy behind me is me, um, you know, looking over my shoulder. Uh, that that is the high point of my professional career uh, is to be able to do that. And uh, I got a chance to do it. Yeah, and there's not many people that can continue and and push and then reach the pinnacle of their profession, right? And I think the fact that you, you take all these steps over time, starting with going back to school, right? You know, 20 year old you, 18 year old you, whatever. And then there's this long path and you know that that path leads to where you're going. There's no guarantee. There's no surety about how that's gonna turn out, yeah. but you know, that's the way it goes. So what, you know, and, and my dad was an Air Force navigator. Uh, I come from a military family. There's this idea that, you know, not everything is guaranteed. There are all these steps, but not everything is guaranteed. Um, I'm a big believer in 80% of life is showing up, right? It's just like that guy who told you that you needed to go ahead and apply for the yeah. program. 
because he may have known something and you didn't. Yeah. But talk about, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about persistence, right? You know, the, the, we've seen the right stuff and movies like that. But what was your sense of persistence and, and your, you know, hey, keep putting one foot in front of another trying to achieve this goal? Well, I think it's doing something you want to do. I mean, I wanted to go to test pilot school and my skipper at the time, he said, he, he, he told me I was, I was getting out of the, I was transitioning out of the, the squadron. And he said, uh, he said, John, if I was a betting man, I'd be betting you'd be getting out of the Navy. And I said, well, you know, I said, given what I've seen is in department heads and how a lot of them, it was, I had an interesting time in my first tour. You know, I watched some department heads really have a difficult time with a couple, with one of the skippers. And I just, I looked at that and thought, do I really want to do that? And I thought, well, if I go down this path, I want to, I'm going to focus on this. And if I can't get this and I'll, I'll transition and do something else. So to me, that was test pilot school and it was, an ast- it was towards the astronaut corps. And my skipper said, well, it's all about you, John. It's not about the Navy. It's all about what John wants. And I said, well, you know, Skipper, you know, I think I, I do my very best in the Navy if I'm doing something I love to do. And that's where I want to go. And I, I'm going to go to test pilot school. And he wanted me to go do something else and, and you know, go to the boat and whatnot. I, I want to go that direction. And I did. And, and if I hadn't, you know, persisted at that, then I, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So um, I know one guy uh, that, that wanted to be an astronaut more than anything in the world. And I, we were in the same uh a billet together he was senior to me and we both interviewed the same year and he um um interviewed before me and then i got called to be interviewed he looked at me like well, wait a minute you know we're competing for the same job and i said no we're not i just if you get it you, i get it great you know whatever i didn't to me it wasn't so competitive that i wouldn't i would not let him see stuff i was doing that's he was a little different cut of cloth um but then i got selected and he didn't. And he said, you know, not getting selected as an astronaut was equivalent to his wife having a miscarriage. I said, what? I said, you're equating not being selected as an astronaut to your wife losing a child? Are you right. serious? I mean, is that where your head, is that your headspace? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fathom that, that, that he was so focused on this end goal that the rest of his career didn't matter to him. And it, it was equivalent to losing a child. So that, to me, was, that was one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard in my in right. my professional career. So, you know, right. love what you do if it takes you down the path that leads to something you would, they would like to do, you know, great. But if you don't ever get that, if I got, if the only thing I did in my career was get interviewed to be an astronaut, I how, how <laughs> you do that, right? Right. Well, it, it went the next step and I got selected. So I was very fortunate. If I didn't get it, you know, I would have, you know, I would have been disappointed. And there's a whole story in that as well. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I got selected. And I made the most of, of getting selected. So one thing that really interests me, you know, uh, and I think everyone uh, has read the bio, uh, your bio to uh, register for this call and, and listen to you. But, you know, your first enrolled member of a Native American tribe to go into space, you did three spacewalks. At what point does that become very obvious and very front and center for you in terms of, you know, you're famous now it's, it's, you're famous as an astronaut. Um, you're famous within your community. You're also, you know, not many people get to become astronauts. But when does that become a factor? Well, I think within, I, I say within a month or two after being selected, uh, one of the folks that was actually on my selection board came to me and said, hey, you know, you're a member of the, uh, the Chickasaw Nation, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, well, um, you know, you're the first member of a fairly recognized tribe we've had in the astronaut corps. I'm like, I am? I, I had no idea. Okay. And, and, and that's like, okay. And she's, well, I've got a bunch of kids coming down from the Alabama Cachata Res and a bunch of tiny tot dancers. Would you like to meet them? I went, yeah, I'd love to meet them. And so NASA about that time was having, they had a pr- program where you could see different folks in the office that were, that were Native American. And, uh, and so I found myself in a position I didn't expect to be in. And, and, but I found that I was, that I had a responsibility in that position because no one ever been in that, that position before. Right. And, and so I, I took it very serious. And I, I, was, I was blessed with the opportunity to, to speak at ACES back. The very, the very first major speaking engagement I gave as an astronaut was to, you know, two or 3,000 students at the George R. Brown Convention Center for an ACES conference. And I thought, you, th- you think training for space is scary? Man, stand up in front of 2,000 people. <laughs> tell a story. I was, I was so incredibly nervous. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was terrible. But I told I told a story. I just I told the story about who I am and where I come from, and and it resonated. I was talking to my aunts, my uncles, my brothers, my sisters, my grand my grandparents, you know, 
that's what it felt like. I, I was, I, I felt totally at home and accepted. And, you know, it's a matter of that, you know, honor who you are, where you come from. That's what matters, you know, and it's not your full blood half, you know, whatever it's, you know, what's a blood quantum it's, you know, do you care about who you are, where you come from? That's what matters. And, and so I found myself uh, now with this, you know, really awesome responsibility to do the very best I could because a lot of people were, were relying on me uh, to do that. You know, I had one guy that was in, when I, when I had just got selected, a friend of mine said, uh, man, I wish I was Indian. I said, excuse me. He said, yeah, I wish I was Indian. I could be an astronaut too. And I said, well, time out. Oh. <laughs> so, so is that the only reason I got selected is because, because I'm, because I'm, you know, Chickasaw. I said, everything else I've done in my career doesn't matter. That's, that's what you focus on is that, you know, that, that one thing. And I said, if that's the one reason I selected, I don't, I don't deserve or belong there. Because, you know, that's taken away from other people that are qualified. If I'm just as equally qualified for the position, and oh, by the way, I'm Native American, that's great. Right. You no, know, but I'll tell you, and I guarantee you this, that other people of color uh, and, and women in the office had this thing hanging over their head that a lot of people look at them and go, the only reason you're there is because you're Native. The only reason you're there is because you're, you're African American. The only reason you're there is because you're a woman. And people actually, you know, people, and I, one of my friends told me that. And I, and it made me work that much harder in my job because I didn't want to give anybody the ammunition to say that was, that was the reason why, you know, that I was, I fully deserved to be there, that I'd worked hard in my career, that I'd done all the right things to be qualified and to be selected uh, for that position. And it did made me work that much. I think that much harder uh, in the office than I think other people might have. That's in, in my own personal opinion. No, the ships on my shoulder help drive us, right? I've been told I can't do a couple of things and Lo and behold, it definitely drives you. So you have a career in the Navy. And then for a lot of folks, you know, Bruce Springsteen has that song, Glory Days, right? And he talks about high school glory days. And people, I found through life that some people stop developing at a certain point, right? So there, people get on the off ramps of their lives and they stay in that moment when it was best for them. So you have this Navy career, then you have this NASA career, right? Which I don't want to spend less time on, but I want to get to the next part, which is you have two complete careers or the pinnacle of your profession, and then you become an educator, right? And you begin to work in your community. Not that you weren't an educator before, but that becomes your focus, sure. um, giving back. And, you know, that's how I've met you. That's how many people on this call have met you. You know, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about what made that transition easy for you and why you chose that path. There's lots of things you could have done, John, and that's the way you went. Well, you know, that is, well, why didn't I stay at NASA? It's probably the first question is, why didn't I stay in this fabulous career? And I'd made a, I made a conscious decision to leave in 2005. Uh, Columbia was a mission after mine. I lost seven friends on Columbia, three of my classmates. Um, I was training for a space station mission. Uh, I was going to command two Russians, do a long duration mission. I was in Russia. I got a, I was in Russia. I got a phone call from a flight doc that said I was disqualified because I have osteoporosis. So I, I came back to Houston you know, with the idea of well, I could fly the shuttle again and I could have flown Hubble, you know, done something like that. But we weren't flying. We weren't flying because of uh, 113 or of, of STS 107, the Columbia. And then STS 114 came along and a big chunk of foam shed off of its external tank. And we didn't fly for two and a half years and another year and a half or three. I didn't know if I ever fly again. I got offered a job as a commercial test pilot for a commercial space company. And I made a really, really tough decision to leave. And I regretted it after about a month. <laughs> long, long story. But, you know, I, I had a, a neat job. We won the same agreement SpaceX did. We didn't have $400 million. That's a story in and of itself. But I found myself in a, in a, in a job now that was terminated because we didn't have the money. And what am I going to do now? And wow, I can't go back to NASA. Once you step out of that office, you can't, you, you can't get back in. Right. And so I started looking around. And I thought, well, and I want to ride a bike across the country, maybe, a, you know, consider it my uh, midlife crisis. I don't know. Your uh, forest I'm, gone. Your forest yeah. gone. I'm tired now. I think I'm going to go home, you know. <laughs> um, so I got on a bike and I rode a bike across the country and I stopped at NASA schools and, and uh, NASA Explorer schools and Indian reservations from the Macaw Nation and the upper uh, the Olympic Peninsula uh, in uh, Macaw Nation uh, all the way down to Florida. And stopped along a, reservations along the way in NASA schools. And uh, in about seven days into the bike ride, I'm in a little town called Lewiston, Idaho. Uh, I knew the elder. Horace Axdale was an elder in this purse, elder. And um, I was going to talk to kids there. And he, he gave a responsibility to a, a woman that was in, in the media and as an educator there while that 
um, she took me up to University of Idaho. I gave a talk up there. Professor up there I had met before on the Columbia, uh, after Columbia, because he'd flown a payload on Columbia with a bunch of Native kids. And, um, and he said, if you're going to PhD, you know, come back and talk to me. Okay, but I don't, I don't live in Idaho, right? Well, the woman was my host. I proposed to her at the end of the bike ride <laughs> and, uh, at the front of the countdown clock at KSC. And I moved to Idaho and I called my friend Ed Galindo, Dr. Galindo, and I said, hey, here I am, you know? Um, and I, I didn't want to go back into engineering. I wanted to, you know, I've been engineer, test pilot, my entire career, you know, I wanted to do something different. And so talking to Ed, he's an educator, done a lot of work with native kids. And he said, there's a, there's a gap that you need to help fill. And that is, you know, you're, you're native, you have a, 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 you know, this real interesting background. If you get a PhD in education, then we can start solving a problem that, that is not, it, it's a tough problem is what makes a native American student successful in engineering or science? Because most of the data is on why there's, why they're not. And it's the idea of the deficit model you know, it could be poverty, it could be alcoholism, it could be the, the, the reasons why kids don't pursue a career in, edu in engineering and science. Well, the reality is, you know, there are thousands of Native people that have, and they've been very successful. So let's find out what that criteria is, what made them successful, and then use that as a model for other kids coming up to say, hey, you know, if they can identify with you and, and you're successful at it, and they come from the exact same background, the same ethnicity, right, you know, why can't, why can't they? Right. So that's that's the that's the direction I went with education and uh, and, you know, to work with Native kids. I did a, my my dissertation was in the, the Duck Valley Reservation with a group of Native kids that had been in a uh, Shoshone Paiute kids that had been in a NASA summer program. And so I looked at what the factors that would motivate and engage them to want to study math and science based on this hands on program and uh, is hands on learning, working with your friends and being able right. to collaborate, you know, be a team player. Um, you can't do it on your own. You know, and so they found the, the practical to the theoretical. And that's how I learned. You know, that's how I learned when I was in the survey team. That's how I learned in the Navy. You know, take, you know, learn the systems and apply them. You know, that's the application of what you learn is the, the better you learn it, the better you can apply it and the safer you're going to be. And that, that's the direction I went. That's incredible. I, I, uh, I think that it's the constant, you know, I, I don't like the word reinvention right? You don't, you're not reinventing yourself because it's who you've been all along, but this idea that we find a new challenge and we rise to it, right? It's what keeps us alive and what keeps yeah. us growing. I think that's what's important, right? It's how we stay nimble. It's how we keep our mind and everything else, but you definitely exemplify that. I, uh, so I've got a question for you, um, and I, I, I leaked this to you before we talked, so, uh, you know, you know what's coming, but um, this is out of left field, you know, we've got all these recreational space rides now. We've got, uh, you know, Richard Branson. We've got Jeff Bezos. My question for you is, you know, we go from the culture of the right stuff to sort of this recreational idea that if you have enough money, you can go into space. I was interested to hear what your thoughts were on that and what that means for space travel. Well, you know, take us take us back almost 100 years. You know, let's go back to the 1920s and say the very, the very birth of uh, commercial aviation. You know, going from you know, 19, you know 1903 essentially, to, you know, for the first time I ever flew. You know, my grandpa was born in 1908. You know, uh, in 1920s, started commercial aviation started taking off, and and you know, in trying to make it as safe as possible at at a cost at a at a um, price point that people can afford to do it. You know, way back then, the only people who could fly were rich people. You know, it was a luxury with suits and ties. It was that you know that type of thing. Right. Accidents happened. People died. You know, in, the, in this learning process to where now we hop on airplane, don't think twice about it, okay? I would like to think commercial space is in that same, is in that same era right now. You know, the expense, the rich people can afford to do it. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't mean to sound bitter about it, but people are gonna die. You know, there are things, accidents are gonna happen because it's a dangerous business. You know, flying is, is early on was a dangerous business as well. You know, as you engineer things and things get better, you learn from your mistakes, that's gonna happen. Uh, to a point where once it's, you know, safe and routine and the price point comes down that, you know, an average person can hop on a plane, you know, a space plane and fly to, you know, New York to Paris and get there, you know, in, you know, less than an hour, you know, suborbital pop over, boom, you're down. Uh, that's fabulous. You know, can, can we do that? And at some point in time, your, your package, you know, they say, you know, you know, it, 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 when it absolutely positively has to be there yesterday. Right. You know, 
um, not tomorrow, yesterday, you go across a date line, you know, come back and it's, you know, the day before, you know, and you get a package from FedEx. So, you know, who knows, you know, point to point. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's just, it's, it's, there's going to have, um, there's going to be learning curves. And uh, unfortunately, hopefully, you know, that people are paying attention to it and, and uh, not going to cut corners. Um, but engineering is engineering. Um, you know, physics is physics. Um, you know, bad stuff happens when things break. And how do you how do you try and engineer so the bad things don't happen? You know, look what happened to uh, STS 107. That was something that's totally out of left field. We never could have we never could have solved if you know in the simulator. That was a totally out of left field. But you know, seven people died because of it. Same thing with the Challenger. Right. Um, there were mistakes made prior to that that should never have let that happen. But you know, when it did happen, you know, mistakes were made that you could have you could have hopefully solved it. But uh, you know, we're human. Right. Absolutely. Well, this one is focused directly on you. It's from Isaac Moore. So I'm going to ask his question. Um, how you feel about astronauts running for public office? I'll warn you, this is a loaded question. We've seen the success of Mark Kelly uh, as a recently elected senator from Arizona. And of course, uh, John Glenn as well. Have you ever thought about running for office? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've thought about it. Say, so, okay, what's, what's, I think I got asked once, you know, John, you need to run for office. We need more military people in in office you know there's not enough folks in congress that are military so yeah it's a true statement on the other hand there's not enough scientists in in the office you know we have a we have a dearth of of attorneys uh in in uh, in public office you know nothing against being an attorney but i need you know we need people that that are science literate and i think mark kelly has said this before you know we need folks that are science literate in office to be able to make decisions in the best interest of the future, you know, what, how our kids are going to live, you know, when you start talking about climate change and you ignore the science behind climate change, you know, it's because you're not, you're not science literate. And the people who are science literate understand that we are having a fundamental impact on our, on our life on this earth uh, by what we do and what we consume. Uh, and, and being able to have people that can make decisions based on their understanding of science and ask, you know, we don't, we all don't know all the answers. We need to have people, we need to go to the people that, that have the answers and understand and appreciate what that is. So yeah, I've, I've thought about it. Um, you know, it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> Had people ask me. I'm glad, I'm glad Mark's there. Good for him. Uh, I don't want to pick up the phone and be asking for money all the time. You know, that's the challenge is, you know, hey, I need, send me 10 bucks, you know, for this, you know, to raise money. That's one of the things that uh, we need to fundamentally change how we, how we elect public officials and how we, uh, you know, how we fundraise. Agreed. Shouldn't be corporate shouldn't be corporate at all. No, I, I'm a big fan of public financing, same amount of money and take it from there. But that's a whole nother panel, right? We can oh, do yeah. that next I, month. I, can, I can hop on that soapbox. I'd be happy well, to. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do that next one. So, uh, you know, kind of my last question, I want to make sure I'm respectful of everybody's time and that we wind up uh, this talk. Uh, and I think it's been fantastic. You know, John, uh, this is a little bit longer than I talked to you the first time, but now I have a lot more information about who you are and where you came from. So, um, I'm a kid, right? I'm in this social media age. Facebook is in front of me. I watch YouTube. Um, there's a there's this plethora of TV programming on Netflix and HBO Max, and there's so much out there to distract my attention. What do we need to do for the youth of today, uh, specifically those kids that may not have exposure for this type of, of uh, work and, and these types of accomplishments? What do you think we need to do to ensure that our kids can dream and that they can look and say, hey, one day I can be, and I'll use this as a paraphrase, the equivalent of an astronaut, right? Like I can see this and I can work toward that. What advice would you give for everybody on, that call to, on this call to create that environment and to lead in that area like you do at ACES? Well, get them outside their comfort zone. Get them outside of this, you know, the, the iPad in the face, the iPhone in the face, get them out into the woods, get them out to experience the world around them, get them out outside of what they see as their own little world, you know, and, and I, I think one of the benefits, as much as I hated it growing up, moving uh, so many times gave me exposure to a lot of different people, a lot of different environments and communities uh, that I think, you know, that I learned from that, you know, a lot of folks that grow up in the same place, be there for the same time, uh, all their lives, there's a some point in time where you need to realize there's, there's a much bigger world out there. You don't have to leave where you are, you have to experience it. You know, be able to experience what's outside of that, that what you is your comfort zone or what you're narrowly focused on. Because uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now 
or too many people are so focused on what's good is in their own little world and don't realize how what effect other people have and, and how can you get out and, and be a part of that. Um, if you, there's something you want to do, find somebody doing it. And if it's not somebody local, hopefully some of your family, your friends, your teachers, professionals can, and that's what ACES does. And I think what you're doing with Hesperus is being able to expose vets to be able to, hey, here's an opportunity to get education to make a difference in your community. Just because you're in your community doesn't mean you can go out and get education, you can come back and serve your community. I think that's what we all, we all strive to do is what can we do best for our families and, and make a difference in the lives of others that are like us and, and, um, and step outside. <clears throat> you know, when you step outside, it's uncomfortable, but you learn something from it. And you may, you may skin your knee and fall down, break an arm, get back up and, and try it again. Because if you, don't, if you don't do that and accept the status quo, um, it's the same thing's going to happen. You know? Yeah. No, it reminds me of something my dad used to say, the world is a big place, but you got to step outside in order to see it. Right. Yeah. And it, yeah. I think that and one thing, of, one thing my, my dad did too, that I appreciate is that, you know, this is a very short period in your life. I remember the very first week I was officer candidate school, you know, you're poopy, you're called, it's called poopy week. You're getting yelled at, screamed at, they're just trying to get you to quit. At the end of the week, I you know, it was like, they read my mail. I, I got on the phone. I got a donut. I got a phone call. And I called home and I said, I hate it here. I want to come home, you know? And, uh, and my dad said, okay, great. You, you come home, you know, 14 weeks from now, your friends are going to graduate. And they're going to go off and career in the Navy. And right. you're going to go where? He said, I know it's hard. He said, stick it out, suck it up. It's a very short period in your life. It'll be over before you know it. And if you make a bad decision, then you're going to regret it. And, and I think my dad may have talked some of that from his own experience, you know, that he, I think he wishes there's certain things he'd done in his life. He was very successful and, and capable, but I think there's decisions that he, he made this way and he, he probably would have gone that way and he regretted it. So it was great advice, you know, and I stuck it out and it happened numerous times in my career, you know, this is hard. I can't do it. This is hard. Well, yeah, you can do it. Just suck it up, put your nose to the grindstone. Other, other folks around you are, are capable of doing it. Why not you? You know, you're, you're, uh, you're just as capable as they are. Yeah. Well, I like what you said before, you know, sometimes when you, when you leave that office, when you jump off that train, you can't catch that train again. Right. So you've got to <laughs> remember. Else. Yeah, exactly. That that's it. Well, uh, John, I really appreciate your time and your, your, your stories today. Um, I, I think, it, you know, one thing I've always been struck is this idea that you've got to keep moving forward. Right. And, and it seems like a simple concept, but crazy things can happen over a lifetime when you keep moving yeah. forward. And I really appreciate your example and the information you shared with us, because uh, it just it helps reinforce what we're trying to do at Hasbrus. It helps reinforce what a lot of students that you touch uh, on a annual and a daily basis, right? And, and everything that they're trying to do. So um, we're going to invite you back. Uh, that's a warning, not a promise. That's a warning. <laughs> and uh, again, I appreciate all your support and service as uh, uh, the lead on our advisory board. All the work you do for Native American kids and in Native communities, as well as your STEM advocacy. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks a lot, Matt. And I wish I could answer all the questions. I I stay on as long as you guys want me to, as long as you want to. I can always do that, but we can always come back and, and do it again later. So yeah, well, uh, I was on you waiting for me, but I know I just, uh, I, I, what's driving this whole talk is your dinner. So I want to make sure we respect that. Uh, that's fine. It, it'll sit there. I'll, I'll get it. In my dog's not going to eat it. So I'm good. The food is so important in this thing. So, um, well, I just want to make sure if we have time for another question. Yeah, go ahead. You got a couple. Yeah. Let's, just, just knock a couple of them out. I'm okay with that. Okay. Um, I asked the political question. Uh, Isaac, if you want to jump on or uh, either Thomas, uh, here's one from Thomas Jenkins. What suggestions do you have for Native American veterans who are from, who are between going home to the reservation or joining civilian work life in a more urban or suburban setting, right? That's one thing we struggle with, with Hesperus, is we're trying to create the opportunities for uh, digital occupations and taking part of this fantastic revolution in technology in the 21st century. But at the same time, we, we know that technology allows us to be remote so we can be anywhere to do it. It's a constant tension about being home in remote tribal communities, but also being a part of this larger corporate or uh, professional lifestyle what are your advice for veterans that are weighing that? It's a great question. Tom. Well, I think, <clears throat> you know, find something you love to do. It just comes down to that. Find something that really challenges you and motivates you. And if it takes you to where some point out of where your community is, realize that what you're learning benefits your community, whether you're there or not. Your education and your, your technical skills, if at some point in time, can translate back to 
to the community you're from, but, you know, look at what you can do that honors your family, honors your ancestors, and, you know, shows that you're capable of, you know, in the military, we hop off, we go off and, and you know, the Native Americans are the most represented minority in the military, right? right. Uh, why? You know, look at, look at what the government's done to, you know, Native peoples over their, their history. You say, why would I do that? Well, because you're protecting your family. You're doing something for the good of your community. Uh, not not telling the United States as a whole, but the people that you care about. Um, you know, and the same thing with education. You can go off and get an education that's going to benefit, you know, the the folks that you care about most by getting out and making, you know, going and getting a job that you know pays, you know, pays for you know better things in your life. You can help your other family, help your family out. You know, whether you're in that you know rural environment or you're in an urban environment, what you do uh, benefits your family in the long run. Yeah, I talk to a lot of audiences about uh, the warrior ethos, right, in Native American communities. And it's this idea, you know, the Western idea is a fighter, but I think the Native American idea is the protector. The protector and including, yeah. including in that protection is culture, right? And that's one thing I learned in the past few years in working in this community is that this idea of protector, but culture is a part of that. It's not just family. It's not just you or your tribe. It's also what you value and what you believe in. I think that's a fascinating concept and more people need to know about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, I think I've hit them up. I, I honestly, I don't see enough inner service banter here, right? I think it's interesting that, you know, the army played a significant role in your life, but you didn't go in the army. I understand why there are not too many army astronauts, but I think it's- too. And a matter of fact, the guys that are in the army that were there, uh, Pat Forrester, Bill MacArthur, um, I think Doug Wheelock, there's a, a few folks that, that were army that, um, you know, they, they had a job at NASA that worked in the astronaut office that allowed people to recognize who they were. And you know, there's some folks in the arm, there are Coast Guard folks, there's uh, Air Force, and we all have fun, all have fun bantering the other, other services, you know. You know, the Navy is there to take the Marines places, you know, and, and uh, you know, the Air Force has really nice golf courses and, and uh, the Navy spends it on ships. So, uh, and, that, and helicopters, you're, you know, little pieces flying really close formation together and, you know, we have fun with it. Yeah, so and this now I do have a question. So Space Force rolled out just recently, right? And as an Air Force grad, we now have people that graduate, you know, much like the Naval Academy, they go into the, either the Navy or the Marine Corps. Uh, Air Force Academy graduates can go into the Air Force or the Space Force. My thoughts are for you, you know, obviously it's evolutionary. What do you think about that? And is it, uh, you know, too late or do you think we're too early on that spectrum? Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the new Space Force. Well, I think, you know, the Air Force was doing that. That was the Air Force. Anybody in the office, an astronaut office that it was an Air Force that want to go back in in the space component, we'll go back in. Were, we had astronauts go back and make four stars. Um, you know, Kevin Shilton, Chile was um, was a four star uh, Air Force officer. Susan Helms went back. She, I think she made two or three stars. So, you know, the, the Air Force had a place for astronauts when they left the office to go back into a space component. Not the Air Force was doing it. To have a whole separate force, you know, to, to do that, just that, you know, I, I don't think it was money well spent on, on the part of the government to do that because the Air Force was doing it. You had missileers, you had folks that were, you had missile wings. Um, and, you know, and they rightly did that. That's, you know, that, that's what they did. So I think, you know, the Space Force was a component that didn't necessarily need to, you know, to, to rise out of the, of the politics of it because I think it was a political thing. Um, but the Air Force is doing a great job. The Navy had a had a space component, but not like the Air Force. If I left the office, um, I really wouldn't have a place to go as a, you know, to get flagged, to make, you know, make one star, two star, three star, four star. And the Air Force has that opportunity. So I think, you know, they were doing the Space Force thing before it became the Space Force. So I just think it was a political issue. That's my my personal opinion. Yeah. And it's a lot of talk amongst the Air Force grads and, and active duty Air Force and Space Force around that. Um, you know, it's also a way to make sure that resources that get carved out go to directly to, to the folks that are serving that space mission. A lot of times I think the Air Force captured the lion's share of a lot of that funding um, and it didn't always go where folks wanted it to, right? But, I never thought about that way. That's true. No, you know, I do think, but I agree. I think it was political um, and we'll see how it goes. I just know that they have silver sashes when they graduate from the Air Force Academy and it looks pretty cool. So we'll see how long that lasts uh, and, and where folks go. Do they get so, to ride the elevators there? Do the Space Force folks get to ride the elevators? Are they off limits as well? They're still off limits. Yeah. I think they're even, they're not off limits to upperclassmen. That's a change, but I'm not going to play old grad here. I'm not going to. Well, unless, you, unless you break your leg, you can ride the elevators, you break your leg. Right? I learned that when I, when I gave a talk there once. You can't ride the elevators? Really? 
That's yeah. true. No, not even as well. Now you can, but you couldn't before. I'll so, be well, anyway, we'll get to get you. We'll get you back in front of the folks at Hesperus, uh, and you know, I'll try to get you uh, to the Air Force Academy as well. It'd be good for you to be home and talk to the cadets out there. Yeah, happy um, to do it. They always need people to tell them about how hard it used to be, right? That's what that's what <laughs> our job. Is. You're gonna you're gonna get a a Navy guy out there that's gonna have hair longer than when he was when he joined the military. Right. This, is, this is the longest my hair has been in 40 years. So and it's just gonna keep growing because I because I can. I don't have to cut it off now. So that's good. It'll drive everybody crazy. I'll enjoy watching that. Oh, they, they're like, well, lay out long hair, dude, man. Hey, oh well, you know, it's okay. Same they'll time. be trying to cut off your mic. They'll be sitting here giving the cut off the mic uh, gesture. So John, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You got to get to dinner and thank you everybody else for joining us tonight. Okay. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. You guys take care. Bye-bye.